Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Invasive Species Center's webinar series. My name is Rebecca Schroeder, and I am the Aquatic Invasive Species Specialist at the Invasive Species Center, and I will be your moderator for today. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am speaking to you today from Robinson Huron Treaty Territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Bay, home of Garden River First Nation, Batchewana First Nation, and the Métis Nation. The Invasive Species Center is a not-for-profit organization that connects stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. We have a lot of great invasive species resources on our website, including species profiles, best management practices, and so much more. So if you have some time, check us out at invasivespeciescenter.ca where you can also uh, check out previous versions of our newsletter and you can sign up for it, as well as our bi-weekly media scan, event invitations, um, where you'll hear about upcoming webinars like this one. So before we get started with today's webinar, there's a couple things that I would like to mention. We're gonna have some time for questions at the end of the webinar. So if you have a question, please type it in the question box and I will read it out loud to our presenters after the webinar. And you can do this at any time. So if a question comes to you, Midway through the presentation, feel free to type it in and, and we'll get to it at the end. If you're having any technical difficulties, please type them in the question box as well, or you can always respond to your registration email and we will do our best to resolve it for you. Lastly, there will be a brief survey following the webinar and if you could take some time to fill it out, we would really appreciate it. Uh, we're just looking for feedback and suggestions for future webinars and, and things like that. So it would be great if you could take some time to fill it out. Today's webinar is titled Invasive Muscles in Ontario, History, Biology, Impacts, and Prevention, and I am pleased to introduce our speakers. Renata Claudi is an environmental scientist with over 35 years of diverse business and technical experience. After more than 15 years in the electric power industry, where she established the Muscle Mitigation Program for Ontario's larger electricity utility, she formed r and Consulting, Inc. to respond to the broader industry need for expert muscle support. As invasive aquatic species become geographically more widespread, Renata has provided muscle control expertise internationally. This includes information on economic impacts, protection of assets, selection of appropriate control options, and installation of these control options. We are also joined by Darissa Vincentini from the Invasive Species Centre, where she is the Community Action Leader. She completed her undergraduate degree in biology, along with obtaining a certificate in geomatics from Algoma University. In her role, Darissa coordinates invasive species education and outreach initiatives, promotes community action to mitigate the spread of invasive species in Ontario. This includes the coordination of the Early Detection and Rapid Response Program that relies on citizen science to help prevent, detect, and monitor new invasions. Darissa believes everyone in the community has a role to play in protecting Canada's forests and waterways and is passionate about sharing the tools and knowledge to do so. So I would like to thank both of you guys for joining us today. Um, and I'm going to pass things over to Renata. So I'll just make you the presenter now, Renata, and you can take it away. Yes, good morning, everybody. Um, show my screen. Uh, I hope that's happening. Yep, we can see it. Okay, excellent. I will uh, indeed be talking about zebra and quagga mussels in Ontario, but I will also be diverting into the rest of North America because um, we do not live in isolation and all our water bodies are interconnected. So the biology of the mussel, both zebra and quagga mussels are part of the drysenic family of mussels. They are freshwater, they are filter feeders, they are capable of attaching to the substrate which differentiates them from any other freshwater species that we have in North America. And they do have a free swimming larva and the free swimming larva is uh, present for quite a long time in the plankton. So those are the main characteristics of the, of the two uh, mussels we are speaking about. How do you tell a zebra mussel from a quagga mussel? Well, if everything is according to the book, the zebra mussel, which is on the left, happens to have a much flatter underside which makes it stand up straight when you put it on a firm substrate, as opposed to the quagga mussel, which has a convex underside and tends to, top, to topple over. When you look at the underside of the mussels, in the case of the zebra mussel, the two valves come together in a nice straight line, while the quagga mussel happens to have this wowie in it. There are occasionally individuals which you can't quite determine uh, if they belong to the one or to the other, but generally speaking, we can tell them apart by these two characteristics. 
Both of them, as I mentioned before, are filter feeders. The particle size they take in is between half a micron and 50 microns. So all the small green algae that's out there, but also any other particles, because they do take all this wa water in up to one liter per muscle per day. And then they sort the um, particles on the gills. So the water comes in into the incurrent siphon, is passed over the gills where it's sort of tasted and sorted. And the stuff that is considered to be edible is sent on to the stomach. And the stuff that is not edible is short circuited back to the excurrent siphon. It's wrapped in um, sort of slimy material and, and leaves the muscle as pseudo feces. So um, they are capable of sort of selecting the stuff they like. The zebra mussels seem to prefer the small green algae, while the quagga mussels seem to be more capable of feeding on detrital material, which tends to be one of the reasons we think that they actually are able to live way deeper below the photic zone. Both the zebra and quagga mussels have what we call this beard on mussels. So these are hairs of sclerotized protein, which are ex extruded by the bissel gland. Many of these individual threads come and form a bissel bundle, and each one of the thread is terminated in a small adhesive pad, as you see here, triangular, and with they cling to the substrate for dear life. They are not easy to remove. Quite frequently, when we try to remove them from the substrate, the bissel gland actually pops out of the foot and the entire bissel bundle is left behind on the surface. <clears throat> this is the life cycle. So both, um, there is male and female adults sitting on the bottom. They release the gametes, eggs and sperm. Fertilization is external. And then they go through this developmental cycle while the individual is in the plankton. So they go from a fertilized eggs into a trochophore, then it becomes a small D-shaped larva. And by this time, there is quite a substantial shell on this D-shaped larva. <clears throat> it looks a lot like a fingernail. It's, it's uh, transparent and flexible, but the two valves are capable of closing and, and protecting the animal from external influences. <clears throat> As the animal grows, the shell becomes more robust and they go through these two developmental cycles. At this point, the larva loses its ability to swim, which is um, done with a velum. It grows a foot, it becomes too heavy to continue in the plankton and sinks to the bottom. When it gets to the bottom and hopefully finds a firm substrate, it goes through metamorphosis into a juvenile and then it goes back into the adult cycle. So the fact that these, these free swimming um, larvae are in the plankton for three weeks means that water currents and other means uh, aid that dispersal in a much wider manner than any other adult mus uh, freshwater mussels that we have. The growth rate of the individuals is very much dependent on the ambient temperature. If it's, too, if it's really cold, the mussels grow much more slowly. Uh, quantity and quality of food that's available because of the tremendous filtering rates that the individuals have and the millions of them that are sitting on the bottom, they can quite handily remove, they basically eat themselves out of their heart and home. So in some cases, you will find that the initial uh, growth is really fast and then the food um, supply dries up and the growth rate becomes much slower. Equally, they can crowd each other out. Uh, the more of them there are, the, the, the less likely they are to succeed. And then there's a bunch of other environmental factors. <clears throat> so just to demonstrate the growth rates, um, the population on the Missouri River is fairly recent. Um, they got there maybe five, six years ago, and they are growing at the rate of 0.1 millimeters per day. On Lake Huron, 
but they have been present for a long time and like Huron is pretty oligotrophic in many locations, the growth rate is much slower. So individual growth rates are very much environment dependent. So best we can tell, the zebra mussels were introduced in 1988 into Lake St. Clair. This is when they were picked up <clears throat> by some biological surveys. And since that time, so, you know, 35 years ago, they have pretty much conquered the Great Lakes and then all the interconnected watersheds till this is a 2017 picture. The red ones are the zebra mussels and you can see that they are present right up to the continental divide with one individual finding at San Houston Reservoir in California. The quagga mussels came in a little later. They are also present on all the Great Lakes, but they are the ones that were able to hop the continental divide and be introduced into Lake Mead on the lower Colorado River. And from that location, they were able to basically be transferred by aqueducts into this entire area. They are now found in Mexico as well. The yellow squares are areas where surveys have found villagers at some point, but they have never actually found adults. So this is where they have failed. And this um, triangle actually is something that has never been confirmed. So this is the current distribution of the zebra and quagga mussels in North America. As you can see, um, we are all interconnected. And in fact, the recent um, invasion of uh, zebra mussels into Manitoba came from the Red River flowing northward from Dakota, North Dakota, and um, it has now taken over and it's pretty much all the way to Nelson River and uh, going on. So what makes mussels survive in some locations and fail in others? The absolute most important um, variable is calcium. If there isn't enough calcium for the mussels to build a shell, they will not succeed. So the, the amount of calcium in the water is what determines if mussels will survive or not. Now, when the calcium is pretty low, as I see say here, uncertainty of villager survival, it's very much dependent on the pH in the area. And if the pH is um, adequate, then the mussels will continue to survive. The, the one thing that um, if, you, if you will excuse me, I'll just get rid of that. Sorry about that. So when the calcium is marginal, um, the pH becomes a very, very important factor. And what we have found is that we can combine these two variables into what we call the calcite index, which depends on the amount of calcium, um, the alkalinity, and the pH and conductivity of the water. I won't bother you with the formula, but let's say that once you build the formula into a spreadsheet and feed in all the lakes in North America with and without dry scented mussels that we could get data for. Obviously, these are not all of them, all of the lakes, but just the ones that we were able to get um, uh, data for. You find that the calcite index needs to be basically above minus negative one for mussels to survive. These few lakes right down here, this is Lake Champlain, which tends to um, go back and forth on the calcite index, depending on the amount of precipitation that happens in a particular year and if the incoming streams are full of humic acid or not. So we have found calcite index to be actually a better predictor of muscle success than just calcium alone, particularly in the areas where the calcium is marginal. So we have applied the calcite index um, to a table. Um, 
just to see where the combinations will or will not support muscles. And then we looked at a system in Southern California. This is the uh, Department of Water Resources that has a huge aqueduct that goes from Northern California all the way down to South because they wanted to know where they should focus their preventative um, strategies. So we have pretty much said, you know, the northern part is not likely to get infected. We're not absolutely sure about this part of the, uh, the state, but down here, down here is where you really need to put all your resources. So they did, and they were able to prevent the muscles from popping up there for almost 10 years. They have only now recently found muscles in this area on Castaic Lake, and um, they are looking at a potential for eradication. So calcite index can be a very useful um, exercise to determine if lakes are or are not vulnerable to mussel infestation. Other potential mitigating factors, um, as I mentioned before, they can crowd each other onto a hard substrate. And if you have a soft substrate on the bottom of the lake, usually there is a pop can or something else that they can climb onto. But if there isn't, they will sink in and suffocate. Low dissolved oxygen definitely doesn't help them. Um, low water temperature in the summer will prevent the villagers from actually developing. High turbidity is something that they don't really like. So in highly turbid water bodies, they are not uh, that's successful. And then the presence of potassium ion. And this is particularly important for provinces like um, Saskatchewan, where there's a lot of naturally occurring potassium in the water. And from a study that actually was done in 1973, so way before the mussels have arrived, it looks like when potassium is greater than 10 milligrams per liter, all freshwater mussels are absent from those bodies of water. And that seems to definitely hold for zebra and quagga mussels as well. When exposing mussels to chronic levels of uh, potassium, even 20 milligrams of calcium caused 100% mortality in 52 days. So any water bodies, and there are many of them in Saskatchewan, which, are slightly, which have slightly elevated potassium levels, will mean that they are bulletproof as far as zebra and, and quagga mussels are concerned. The upper thermal limit, I mentioned that before, greater than 28 degrees centigrade for villagers tends to make them um, expire before they can develop into adults. We've seen that happening on the lower Colorado River. It's not something that happens very often in uh, Canada, but it can, especially this summer. It's been very, very hot in some areas. And the upper thermal limit for adults seems to be about 31 degrees centigrade. So how do they get around? Um, definitely, recreational boating seems to be the way that they are getting around a lot of the uh, lakes and uh, other water bodies. So there's lots and lots of um, literature out there where you should be looking for the mussels and how you should be cleaning your um, watercrafts. And it really is worthwhile because we have seen lots of trailered boats, especially early on before people became aware of this, which were going like this down the highway, going from one lake to another. And although some of these mussels will desiccate during transports, particularly during summer when it's hot and dry, a lot of them in the areas which are sheltered or if it's raining and humid can stay out of water and alive for up to about two weeks. Wakeboards, um, wake, wake boats are another one that, that is a bit of a concern because they do seem to have ballast water uh, in them that doesn't quite all get taken out before people move them from lake to lake. So wakeboards are something to be aware of. And then here is a whole bunch of other vectors of introductions. Anglers have brought them in bait buckets. Man-made canals have made it easier for them to spread around North America. Aquariums, probably not as much of an issue because people are now much more aware about not dumping aquariums into, into lakes and rivers. 
flooding in the, on the Mississippi has introduced them into a lot of internal lakes. Divers have brought them into quarries that then have to be exterminated. Fish stocking is one of the things that people are aware could bring them and are working really hard with hatcheries to prevent that from happening. Aquatic plants, they love to raft on aquatic plants. So aquatic plants from one lake, if they get caught on the trailer and can be transferred, they definitely are a vector. And then of course there is the drift um, in terms of all the villagers that are floating about and moving. And in some cases there have been intentional introduction mostly into farm ponds and things like that. So what is the best defense in having these things introduced into a water body near you? Definitely public awareness programs. And um, when they were first found in the Great Lakes and I was working with, for Ontario Power Generation, we spent a lot of time and effort partnering with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Ontario Ministry of the Environment to do a public outreach campaign. Brochures, stickers, you name it, we had it. And we also sponsored the Aquatic Invasive Species Helpline and the conference um, with Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. So having this, this, this helpline or, or hotline, um, was we were able to track the spread of mussels, which was very beneficial to us uh, in terms of what assets we were having to protect most diligently and most quickly. Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters worked with cottage associations to annually sample a lot of lakes. And now I am really happy to see that the um, Innovative Species Council is continuing this effort because I think um, the citizen science is part of the public awareness program and it's very effective. These are the two websites on the web. I understand there is also invasivespecies.ca that I didn't put here. So lots of information on all those websites. So why is it so bad to have zebra aquaga mussels in your area? Well, they do actually have pretty significant impacts on the environment. Now, on one hand, they increase the water clarity. So because of all the filtering, they take the small particles out of the water and they deposit it on the bottom. So a lot of the lakes where the mussels have been introduced have become much clearer. It looks great, but it also means that the macrophytes, the big algae that depend on sunlight penetration through the water, have now started growing. So you have gone from murky, weed-free lakes to clear but very weedy lakes and water bodies. Because of the way that they, um, the mussels filter the particles out, pollutant cycling has changed. There's possibilities of bioaccumulation of individual pollutants, either in the mussels themselves or sitting on the bottom. <clears throat> The mussels have also shifted the energy from the pelagic zone by taking all the small green algae out of that zone that other things feed on and put it in the bottom of the, the water body because that's where the feces and pseudofeces are. So things like amphipods have become much more prevalent and feeding on this um, nutrient-rich ooze that is sitting there. That in turn has led to some changes in fisheries, although not as profound as we were afraid of. And, you know, tourists really don't like walking on broken shells, so there was some impact on tourism. <clears throat> I don't think that we have really seen any drop in property values because it's never happening these days. And they do present a possible new food source for a lot of other animals. One of the things I didn't mention before is that they do foul all the hard surfaces like other freshwater bivalves, crayfish, anything that basically moves slowly will suddenly get a load of mussels on it. Now the crayfish, because they mold, they get rid of it. But in terms of the native mussels, the unionids, if they are carrying this much uh, in terms of uh, zebra and quagga mussels on them, they will get pushed into the substrate and usually suffocate. 
So we have seen huge declines in freshwater mussels. I did mention the increase in macrophytes, and it not, it's not just a little bit, it's a lot. Uh, some of the facilities on lower Colorado were sort of able to deal with the mussels through a variety of control strategies, but the amount of increased vegetation that was coming into their plants was actually much harder to deal with. I mentioned the changes in the fish habitat. Walleye, for example, likes murky water um, to swim in. Once it becomes beautifully clear, they look for other areas. And as I mentioned, the macrophytes, not only do they cause the problems just by themselves, but they present a way of adult mussels moving from one location to another. In terms of pollutant cycling uh, and possible bioaccumulation, we have seen some botulism outbreaks, particularly on Lake Erie, where the spores of botulism come out of the sediment when the oxygen is depleted at the depth. They get picked up by the um, mussels themselves. And then before the mussels can actually expire, they are fed on by either fish or birds. And then these in turn die of botulism. So it is possible. It's not as frequent as we, again, were afraid of, but it can happen. So that's impacts on environment. Now, impacts on man-made facilities are pretty much as important. So these are the kind of things that we have to be aware of. Muscles growing in place inside piping will decrease flow. That in turn will plug essential components. And there is an increase in corrosion underneath the muscle colonies, which attacks the materials of construction. What systems are at risk? Basically any external structure or a buoy or a marina dock. Um, as well as internal piping, which is exposed to raw water where the villagers are present. Now, speed of flow will prevent villagers from settling, but the flow will have to be more than one and a half meters per second continuously before settlement will not occur. So for some, in some areas of the industrial complex, the flow will be very fast, the muscles will not be able to settle, but then they will close down. The system will stay filled. For example, the penstocks and Hoover Dam and the mussels will absolutely settle down. What kind of infrastructures are we concerned about? Well, drinking water plant intakes, particularly any industrial cooling water that, that may be out there using raw water from the lakes or rivers. Irrigation systems in agriculture have become um, plugged. Anything that floats on the lake, docks, bridges, buoys, so on, boat hulls, absolutely, and fire protection system, both municipal and industrial. So I mentioned that the decrease in pipe system diameter and flow due to muscles growing in, 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 um, in place happens. And here are some examples of that. So down here, on, you see a lot of small mussels just sort of colonizing. And then as they grow, they take up more and more real estate and prevent the water from passing through. But there is also a second way that they plug components, and that's by these clumps of mussels, which are probably alive. And they generally come from some upstream location like this one, where mussels settle on top of each other they create these what they call druses or, or clumps, and then these will break off and be sent down the piping system basically to plug the next small orifice that they hit on. And in that case, the only way to get rid of them is to physically remove them. And there is a lot of real estate on um, industrial systems where the mussels have a lot of hard surfaces to settle on. This actually is a pump impeller. So I mentioned that the additional risk to the muscles uh, being in the system is that they can uh, cause increased corrosion on the materials of construction. And they do that either through mechanical damage of those surfaces, the fact that you are pulling them off just to keep the water flowing, 
uh, you may be pulling off some rust particles. And then underneath the pseudo feces and feces, there is usually an anoxic environment and sulfur reducing bacteria thrive. It's very low pH and you get some pitting corrosion there as well. So what kind of control strategies are available to us? Uh, there is quite a bucket list and um, I will zip through these, but please feel free to ask me about any of them. So basically the control strategies are either proactive, you do something that will prevent the muscles from settling on the surface or piping that you are protecting, or they are reacting, reactive. You allow the muscles to settle and then you clean them off. So these two approaches, both of them are valid and both of them have been practiced on the Great Lakes. The pro proactive strategy, once again, it targets the stuff that is in the plankton and these are the individuals in particular that you're targeting because these are the ones that are ready to settle. These guys will just keep on going. And then the reactive, you can either get them right here when they have just settled, or you can wait till they become fairly big um, as long as your system allows that. So for external structures which are in direct contact with the environment, you cannot isolate them in any way. Mechanical cleaning has been used for a long time. Either you dewater those structures and use something like a power wash, or underwater you scrape, use divers to scrape and vacuum or power wash. Power washing underwater is a bit more difficult. Uh, here's an example from one utility where they had to dewater their intake structures and then send in these guys uh, with um, pressure washers to, to clean them out. In terms of being proactive and protecting these surfaces, provided you can dewater them, there is a bunch of anti-fouling coatings that can be applied either to steel or concrete. They come in basic two flavors. One is the non-toxic soft silicones, um, which is a barrier coating. The, um, the muscles just cannot hold on to it, they slide. And then there is the toxic ones, which are either copper or zinc based, um, that are bleeding some um, copper ions primarily. And uh, again, because muscles are very sensitive to copper, they will not settle. So of the two types of coatings, number have been, and many of them have been uh, put on the market. They're not cheap, as you can see. The preparation to put them on is quite onerous. And many of them fail after 12 to 18 months. So it's really important that you only use coatings that have been tried and true uh, for over a longer period of time. Usually we have tested coatings for as many as 10 years. Um, there is one, the, the BioClean silicone, that's a soft coating on the left, and then the copper beryllium on the right. The uh, recently US Bureau of Reclamation has been doing a lot of testing at, on Parker Dam on the lower Colorado River. They have tested a whole bunch of um, coatings. The report is available on their website. Basically the bottom line is that the soft silicone that was made by Fuji and recently bought by Sherwin Williams seems to be the winner of the coding race. For internal piping systems, obviously, you know, coatings are not something that you can do because how would you do that? So in terms of reactive options, you have the thermal wash, um, either a little bit of hot water for a long period of time or a lot of hot water for one hour. Thermal spray, mechanical scraping, that happens a lot in large diameter pipes. Uh, flushing with weak acids, freezing, desiccation, oxygen deprivation, all of those have been tried and, uh, and they all work. And then if you can't do that, you can move to either non-oxidizing chemical treatment or oxidizing chemical treatment. The non-oxidizing treatments are things like aquatic herbicides that have copper in them, pH adjustment, um, Zequinox, copper ion, you know, there's, there's quite a number, but unfortunately many of them are actually not approved for use in Canada. So that is something that we need to keep in mind. The non-oxidizing chemicals, usually proprietary, 
So there is a chemical manufacturer that has either registered the chemical for use for some reason, and it will charge you a lot of money for it. Most of those non-oxidizing chemicals have to be detoxified, with the exception of Maxell. Um, Maxell is actually something that is added twice a day and does not have to be detoxed. So there is a whole lot more on, on, propri on proprietary non-oxidizing chemicals. Again, it you know it, we can take half a day talking about them. The biopesticides Equinox is worth mentioning. It's a substance that is actually produced by a soil bacteria, and it seems to be very specific to zebra and quagga mussels. Um, it was discovered by Dan Malloy in upstate New York. It is now being marketed by Marone Organic uh, Innovations. The problem is uh, that it is an expensive way. You have to grow the bacteria in large fermenters, then you have to dry it, and then you have to feed it to the mussels. And sometimes they eat it, and sometimes they don't, and sometimes it's 100% effective, and sometimes it's not. So definitely a potential, very good potential, environmentally friendly, um, relatively expensive. BioBullets is something that came out of Britain. And what these guys did is they took a toxic core, something that would be toxic to the muscles, and they put a really ed yummy edible coating around it. So muscles have an ability to sense if something is, um, especially in an oxidizing chemical, toxic, and they will close their shell and not feed. If, however, you put this toxic uh, um, substance inside an edible coating, they will continue to filter happily and you can get them to accumulate a, a lethal dose fairly quickly. <clears throat> Again, something that has not been approved for use in Canada. It has been used in Britain. Um, it, was, it was celebrated a few years ago, but I haven't seen a lot of use of it lately. Copper iron, I keep mentioning that. Copper iron is something that we know is um, very lethal to, to most mussels and snails. So um, it can be applied in different ways. This is a copper iron generator that's on the market. A lot of people um, say this is a really easy way to get a, a stream of copper into the water to treat mussels. We have found when we tested it that um, it actually is quite difficult to work with. Um, and we don't know how much copper it's shedding into the water at any one time. We prefer to be looking at the aquatic herbicides, which have a lot of copper in them. And they are very, very effective in terms of controlling mussels um, at very low levels. So something like 100 parts per billion you will get 100% mortality in six days at a fairly warm temperature range. So there's no doubt that copper can do a very good job in controlling muscles. Again, this stuff has not been approved in Canada for use against muscles. It is used quite frequently for aquatic weed control. pH adjustment, we basically take the advantage of the fact that this is the sweet spot for the muscles. And if you can adjust it to something lower or something higher, you will A, prevent settlement, and in the long term, actually get rid of the adults. Potassium salts, we have discussed those. Um, you know, 20 milligrams per liter will cause death in 52 days. 200 or greater parts per million of potassium will cause death in 48 hours. So either a little for a long time or a lot for a short time. This has been used for <clears throat> the eradication attempt on Lake Winnipeg. It worked beautifully. It did not cause any mortalities of fish. Um, unfortunately, because the um, Red River continues to pump villagers into Lake um, Winnipeg, it, was, it failed. In terms of oxidizing chemicals, we were just up to now talking about non-oxidizing chemicals. So oxidizing chemicals such as chlorine, bromine, ozone, you know, the stuff that we usually use in water treatment, they're all effective, but they are considered to be toxic by the muscles. So they do try to avoid them by closing their shell for up to two weeks 
before they have to take a breath. Um, we have used oxidizing chemicals proactively by putting in a little bit during the time that the zebra mussel villagers are in the water or quagga mussel villagers, and that prevents settlement. Uh, so anything between 0.3 and 0.5 ppm of total residual chlorine will prevent settlement. You can also use it semi-continuously with the same results. Now, the regulatory limits for discharge of chlorine is 10 parts per billion total residual chlorine, which is pretty low. And there is an objective of two parts per billion. This is what you can measure. This is what you cannot measure, but you have to do it by um, calculation. We've also tested ozone at one of our facilities on the Great Lakes. And it does as good a job as chlorine with possibly less environmental impact. And it's still in use today at, uh, at that facility. One of the things that we really like is filtration, all kinds of filtration, sand, uh, media filtration, mechanical filtration, basically can remove all the ready to settle villagers and prevent settlement downstream. Um, there is cartridge filters and bag filters for small systems, and they all do a good job. But the ones that we are most excited about is these self-cleaning small pore filters, and provided that the mesh in them is square weave and well supported, these kind of filters can remove pretty much 99.9% .9 of all the ready to settle villagers from any water that's coming in. Usually it's not 100% because there is usually a bit of leakage around some of this stuff. And occasionally if we find a villager on the other side, which doesn't matter in an industrial complex, but it sure ma matters if you are transferring water from one watershed to another. There's a number of these filters in use today and most of them do a really good job. And uh, the only complaint that people have is that they actually do need some maintenance and in an industrial setting that can be quite painful. But as I said, the amount of, um, the number of villages that it takes out is, is more than substantial. The other, Non-chemical proactive option is the use of UV systems. Um, this started probably more than 30 years ago when we were playing with small UV systems at Ontario Hydro. We found out that if you expose villagers to UV, we did decrease settlement downstream. These are the uh, guys that we are targeting. And provided that your water is trans, has good transmissibility to UV, it can do an excellent job. Um, there is a lot of UV systems that are now available, mainly because of the ballast water control um, industry, and they are being used in a number of industrial locations as well. Um, we, When we did the experiments, we, we basically decreased the settlement to zero, depending on the dose that we applied. So even doses as small as 20 millijoules were able to decrease settlement by 88 to 90%. So as I mentioned, they are now being installed in industrial facilities and uh, they are being used to control um, settlement downstream in a proactive manner. So obviously there is lots of ways to minimize fouling. I have gallop through these at a tremendous rate. Um, which one is the right for you? Depends on what the regulator says, what the operator says, what's cost effective, what has minimal impact on the environment. But the only way you're gonna know is by um, becoming familiar with all these options and looking at them from the point of view of a facility operator. And I think that's all I have, Rebecca. Perfect. Thank you so much, Renata. I am going to 
make myself the presenter again, and then pass it back to Teresa, um, who I'm going to share keyboard and mouse with. All right, seems to be working. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you so much, Renata. That was packed full of a lot of valuable information. As Rebecca mentioned, my name is Darissa Vincentini, the Community Action Leader at the Invasive Species Center. I just wanted to take this opportunity to quickly showcase one of our projects at the ISC related to invasive mussels, just as one example of something that is currently going on for monitoring and citizen science. The Invasive Species Centre has partnered with the Federation of Ontario's Cottagers Association to create the Invasive Species Awareness and Monitoring Program for Lakes Education Ontario, otherwise known as iSample Ontario. This was adapted from a previous citizen science effort through the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, who supplied materials to community members to sample their own lakes for invasive mussels. This community science initiative is geared to help citizens prevent, detect, and monitor aquatic invasive species in inland lakes, since it is our best defense against establish establishment of these species and their associated impacts on our ecosystems, the economy, and society, as well as human health. The community science portion of the project focused on invasive mussels, such as the quagga mussels and zebra mussels, as well as spiny water flea, which is an invasive zooplankton or tiny organism that outcompetes eats native species for food and makes jelly-like masses that get caught and tangled, and tangled in fishing equipment. So the invasive mussels are widespread across the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River, as Renata mentioned, and you can see that on this map. And there are some reports of it in the, on inland lakes in central and eastern Ontario. iSample Ontario addresses an environmental need by understanding the potential spread of zebra mussels even further within inland lakes, the most critical pathway for spread of aquatic invasive species is recreational boating. And by understanding what lakes are at greater risk for zebra and quagga mussel presence, then prevention can begin. With funding from the Ministry of Environment, Cons Conservation and Parks, we had 50 FOCA members as citizen scientists that sampled 25 lakes in the Lake Huron, St. Lawrence and Lake Ontario watersheds. We chose the 25 lakes based on having high, uh, high calcium levels and presence of a boat launch. Recreational boating acts as the pathway for invasive mussel introductions into new territory, while the calcium provides a preferred habitat for establishment. So together, these two things put the lake at risk of invasion. The success of this project is due to the 50 FOCA volunteers that participated in collecting plankton samples using these specialized fine mesh nets on the left um, called plankton haul nets and filtered eDNA samples that are shown on the right. eDNA is DNA that is collected from environmental samples such as soil, water, or snow rather than directly sampled from an individual organism. As various organisms interact with the environment, DNA is expelled and it accumulates in its surroundings and we can pick that up. The lake samples are being analyzed this fall where a positive result will indicate the presence of invasive mussels and the negative result will indicate that there's no known presence. And the word known is very key because even if we find nothing, that doesn't mean that there aren't any present and proper precautions should always be taken to prevent the potential spread species. Uh, if or when mussel villagers are first detected in a lake, there's about a two year period before adult mussels become noticeable. So through this project, if villagers are discovered in one of the samples, it'll give us a chance to heed the warning and prepare for negative impacts of zebra mussels. The second part of this project is to encourage more widespread awareness of aquatic invasive species and the boating pathway. So we launched a photo contest and we're calling on all Ontarians, including yourselves, to submit a photo along with a description of how you are protecting your lake or why you're protecting your lake from invasive species introductions for a chance to win an awesome lakeside package, which is uh, in the picture on the left. The prize includes an awesome camping hammock, waterproof JBL speaker, camping blanket, a chili moose tumbler, and some awesome ISD swag. 
Through this photo contest, we hope to provoke some thought and raise awareness on the impacts of invasive species to our waterways and how to prevent introductions and spread. The results of the contest entries will help us gain a better outdoor enthusiasts and shoreline property owners want to protect, protect their waterways, as well as what they are willing to do to limit pathways of spread. So you can enter to win by going to invasivespeciescenter.ca forward slash iSample on, where you can also learn more about the iSample project. And that's it, quick and short. Uh, thank you for your time. I hope you all enjoyed today's presentation and gained a lot of valuable information from Renata. And don't forget to enter the photo contest. Thank you. Thanks, Drissa. Um, so we do have about 10 minutes for questions and we've had a few come through. So if anyone um, has a question, please feel free to type it in the question box now, but I'll start with what we have. So our first question, Renata, is how do we prevent the spread of zebra quagga mussels in the aquarium trade through vectors like the moss ball scare that we just recently had in the US and, and actually a little bit in Canada too? Um, absolutely. Well, luckily when the moss ball issue uh, was detected, we as a group of invasive biologists worked very hard to come up with a protocol to decontaminate all the aquariums where they had been and also the water in which they had been uh, placed. And um, I, I am fairly certain that they have been contained. I think in this particular case, the uh, fault was perhaps with the importer um, of these um, moss balls that, um, you know, didn't check what else was on them. But um, I think it was caught early and I think it was dealt with pretty successfully. Great, thank you. Um, I'd, I'd just like to add too to that, that I think a really important part of um, prevention of the spread through like the aquarium trade, as an example, is just general awareness and encouraging people to not let it loose and learn how to check your moss balls. I know that Fisheries and Oceans Canada has some great resources on their website for how people can check their moss balls for um, potential contamination and things like that. So that would just be something I would like to add. Um, the next question is, for Renata, can you clarify what a moderate level of infestation is versus a high level of infestation in terms of density, um, biomass, and or distribution? Um, good question. Um, usually we consider 100,000 per square meter to be an intensive infestation and um, sort of the maximum, well, not the maximum, but but certainly on that on that end of the scale. Anything between 50 and 100 per square meter, and this is sort of a sustained level, like it never actually gets much greater than that, is what I would consider moderate infestation. And we saw moderate infestations like that in lakes where the calcium was um, uh, probably around 18 milligrams per liter, and um, the pH was about 7.8. So as as the as the calcite index fluctuates in those lakes from year to year, it tends to sort of keep the population down to a dull roar. Thank you. Um, the next question is, does climate change play a role in increasing mussel populations? Um, again, a really good question. Um, we have actually found um, that the upper thermal limit is being exceeded in a number of water bodies, particularly south of the border. And in some areas of Texas where the water um, bodies were fairly shallow, the upper thermal limit was exceeded and the mussels were eliminated from a few of those water bodies. So if anything, it seems to be controlling them on the high end of the thermal. Um, we have not seen um, water bodies in Canada which are too cool in the summer for the mussels to reproduce uh, at this point. So as the water warms up, maybe that will happen, but we haven't seen that yet. Great. Um, the next, oh, the next one's just more of a comment on the moss ball issue. Um, just a note that 
eDNA testing was conducted at stores selling moss balls to ensure systems weren't contaminated, um, at least out in the Maritimes. So that was just a, an additional thing to add there. So our next question is, do you know of any studies or risk assessments for the spread of AIS on um, like inflatable boats or paddle boards or things like that? Um, so anything that is not in the water for a long period of time tends not to have muscles attached to it. So paddle boards, usually the way that I see them being used, they go into the water for maybe an hour or two, and then they come out of the water, they dry uh, while on shore. And so even if there is a villager present on the surface, it will become desiccated fairly quickly. Inflatable boats, again, I think most of the time they're being used for day use rather than something that would be moored in the water for two, three weeks um, at a time, the way that a lot of other watercrafts are. So although it's not impossible that these would be vectors of transfer, they are very unlikely to be so. Okay, the next question is, do zebra mussels facilitate aquatic macrophyte growth by allowing more light to penetrate the benthic zone or vice versa? Uh, the first one, yes, they absolutely do that. They, they do increase the clarity of the water and sunlight penetration, and that does certainly seem to stimulate the growth of macrophytes and particularly to much greater depths. Great. Uh, the next question is, what is the acceptable calcium range before mussels become a problem? Well, it's that 15 milligrams per liter zone that, that we sort of um, um, skate around. And it really depends on the pH of the water as well. So um, when I was talking about Lake Champlain, I think the, the calcium in there is about 18 milligrams per liter, but because so much of the humic acid from the surrounding area drains into Lake Champlain, the pH tends to be pretty low, like 7.5, 7.6. And um, that seems to be that magic combination, but um, there is still some uncertainty. So it's, I would say that the, um, that the zone where the muscles are and um, may or may not survive is between 12 and 16. Uh, set, I would say anything below 12 is probably unlikely to survive unless the pH is really high, probably in the 9, 9.2 zone. And anything over 16, you know, if the pH is, is in the 8, 8.2, you might get some survival. So so there is this gray zone in the middle. Okay, uh, the next question is, has the calcite index assessment been done on a wide scale across Canada? And is this similar to the assessment of watershed suitability conducted by DFO? I believe DFO used calcium only for the suitability assessment because at that point the calcite index was not you know we haven't we haven't really published that so i think the answer is no not 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 across canada and you do need a substantial amount of data on any one water body to be able to do the calcite index properly so you know it's 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 probably more useful for something like the um, aqueducts, although it could be done. Awesome. Okay, well, that's all the time that we have for, for questions. So if there are any more, please feel free to, to reach out to the Invasive Species Center and we can get your question answered for you. Um, I would like to thank everyone once again for tuning in today and listening. And again, thank you to Renata and Darissa for taking time out of their very busy schedules to speak with us today. Uh, another reminder that we do have a survey at the end of this webinar that'll pop up on your screen. You'll also get it in your follow-up email tomorrow. So if you could take some time to fill that out, we would really, really appreciate it. Um, again, thank you so much. We have a, another webinar in October that's gonna be on LDD. So stay tuned for some registration details on that on our website or um, if you sign up for our email marketing 
stuff. So once again, uh, oh, and the last thing is this webinar was recorded and it'll be available on our website as well, uh, invasivespeciescenter.ca on our webinar page. So thank you again, everyone, uh, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.